Hey everybody, Ryan here. We just wanted to say before we kick off the show today, uh, one more thank you for all the growth we've seen in the podcast for the Facebook group and the Patreon supporters. Uh, you guys have supported us in a lot of different ways. There's one other way that you guys could support us, and the coolest part is it's super duper free. Um, on whatever service you're listening to the What It Podcast on today, if you could just hop in and leave us a rating and review, whether it's iTunes or Stitcher or Overcast or whatever you're listening on, if you could just hop in and give us a quick rating and review, uh, it is really helpful. It means a lot to us. Thanks again to everybody for all of your support. Uh, we got a fun one today, so let's start the show. Welcome to the What If Podcast with your hosts, Spencer Worth Davis and Ryan Copperood. This episode of the What If Podcast is brought to you in part by Button Poetry, where poetry is not dead. As the premier place online for live performance videos of spoken word and slam poetry, Button Poetry won't bore you like your high school English textbooks did. Find real stories you'll want to listen to and art you'll actually care about by visiting them today at buttonpoetry.com. Hey, Ryan. Hi, Spencer. What up, though? I'm so used to saying this is the What If Podcast, but British lady, still out here for us. Not necessary, bro. Doing it well. It's the best $10 we ever spent. Thanks, British lady. Uh, what's up, Spencer? How are you? Oh, I'm good, man. Been good. reading this crazy-ass story all day. And oh, boy. Trying to track down newspaper articles from the 70s. Spencer and I, are. we've been a little like... Uh, like that classic style of movie scene where you got like the newspaper clippings on the walls with the yarn and the Dude, it's only markers. a matter of time before that is our studio. <laughs> Maybe we should create a wall like that just to convince people that we're crazier than we really just are. Just so that my wife has me committed well, next time she walks in here? Well, well, <laughs> if she hasn't already, bro, I yeah, think you're, good point. you're probably good. Um, but we have been, uh, Spencer and I have been down the k-hole uh the rabbit hole of of a very interesting story uh today we're asking the question what if you never came home yeah um and <clears throat> we're gonna that will make sense later um but i don't think we're gonna give too much context other than um we might just dive right into the story yeah just uh real quickly so i came across this story on I don't know, two, maybe three days ago. Yep. Um, browsing unresolved mysteries on Reddit. Shout out to unresolved mysteries. I, I like that. I like that they had to call the Reddit that because unsolved was like, like former, like discussion on former episodes of the show. Yeah, um, I don't know. I guess I uh, was just taken. I'd never considered that before. But somebody, somebody posted a question of what is one story that seems, uh, sort of simple or one dimensional but actually has a very uh, deep rabbit hole behind it and the story came up from 1978 that we're that we're going to share with you momentarily here but i just wanted to give a quick shout out to uh yeah that subreddit and um the user word blender op for for tracking down a lot of this information, um, which wasn't super easy to do considering it's now almost 40 years old and this story didn't get a whole lot of traction nationally. OP! So. That means original poster for you non-Redditors out for there. For you noobs. <laughs> noobs. <laughs> N-0-0-B-Z. Uh, yeah, so let's, I guess we'll just dive into the story. Yeah, um, man. This story doesn't have a cool name yet because I don't think it ever really got enough traction. It doesn't have like a... So and so incident yeah. name yet. I tried to create a bunch of them. Yeah, any good ones? Well, I'm I'm more just used to like them being uh, the incidents being location based. Oh right. So you there? So this happens in California, specifically Northern California, Yuba County. Uh, that we spent some the time. The Yuba incident is, is strong. That's kind of what I was going to yeah, go with was yeah. the Yuba incident. We'll call it that. I like All right, that. We're going to go with the Yuba incident then. So February 24th, 1978. Three days before my birthday. Well, I was not born in 1978. But say you're old as fuck. <laughs> um, five men from Yuba City, California, which is about 40 miles north of Sacramento. Um, 
Their names are, or were, I guess, Jack Hewitt, Gary Matthias, William Sterling, Jack Madruga, and Theodore, is it Weir? I pronounced it Weir. Okay. It's W-E-I-H-E-R. Weir, yeah. I guess. Ted, Jackie, Jack, William, and Gary. Okay. Are the five boys. Yeah, there we go. Or they're, they're not boys. Yeah. They're between the ages of 24 and 32. Um, they grown. They grown. Three of them had developmental disabilities, um, and although it sounded like they were pretty high functioning in terms of uh, they held down jobs and had spent time in, in group homes and right. lived fairly independent lives. Right. Um, one of the men had schizophrenia, which was being controlled successfully, it sounded like, with medication. He was a former armor vet. That was Gary. Yep. And one of them was not diagnosed with anything, but was described as, quote, slow. Yeah. Which apparently was a medical term back then that was acceptable. But, I don't think it was a medical term. Well, maybe not a medical term, but um, this was, that was William Sterling was, uh, no, excuse me. Jack was also, that, that fifth one was also another army veteran, right? Yeah, Jack Madruga was another army veteran, and he was the one who was described as slow. Yeah, today it would probably be like, uh, what is that? PDNOS, something disability not otherwise specified. So you don't it. totally fit the uh, descriptors of something specific. For any specific disability, but there's something. Okay. Elements of, of something. Sure. Um, and these, these guys played on a basketball team together. A rec league. Yeah. Spencer and I played on a rec league. We did. We get it. Yep. Shout out to basketball. Shout out to basketball. <laughs> and uh, on Friday, the 24th of February, they were going about 50 miles north of Yuba City to a town t- called Chico to attend a college basketball game together. Because in Chico is uh, California State University at Chico, and uh, apparently they were going to support the away team, so they were not supporting California State. It was UC Davis versus somebody, right? Okay, so they were supporting UC Davis then? Sure. Because UC was on the road to go visit them? I, yeah, not a I super know. relevant detail, but I just know that they were not going to like a school they were familiar with. This was like the away team school. Gotcha. <clears throat> so on a Friday night, they drive about 50 miles north to Chico to go to this game. Um, however, that night, they never returned. And the following morning, their families got in contact with each other, realized that none of the guys had come home. And on Saturday morning sometime, their families contacted the police to report them as missing. So uh, one of the first things that I I know that we haven't even fully gotten into how strange this story gets, but one of the initial strange things that just kind of struck me odd was like, I mean, I don't know. I guess it's I guess it's maybe not that odd, but I would figure five men, one with schizophrenia, one described as slow, and three with the mental de- developmental disabilities all going on a 50 mile road trip together away from their parents, away from their homes. They're 30 years old though, like Yeah, but there's also like there's no cell phones, there's no GPS, like I guess I don't have any like actual uh, context around their conditions specifically. So I don't know how, um, you know, how developmentally disabled some of these guys were, but it just seems like a, I don't know. It seems like a lot. Yeah, it was hard. Be- so there's, there's very little information about this story. Yeah, is it like four in or five articles total? I could only find two, honestly. Yeah. And then other articles that sort of rehashed that information. Okay. So most of what I'm pulling from is either from, um, a Washington Post article or a um, an LA Times article. And we'll put and links are, to those on whatifpodcast.com if you want to go check yeah, out the show notes Yeah, there. they're both available online. Um, LA Times ran two articles about it, one immediately after they went missing, and then one months later as sort of a, a follow-up to that article. Right. Um, but the the Washington Post article was the only national story I could find about it. The only thing okay. outside of California. So I, anyway, it, I I had a hard time getting a feel for these guys uh, as people, just in terms of how able they were. Um, 
I mean, people with schizophrenia, that has no, if, if, if it's being treated, that has no effect on your ability to do whatever. Live your life. Yeah, no, yeah, totally. I mean, and like these guys had or were all living independently. Two of them had been in the army. Like I, I, I get the feeling that it wasn't as significant as you might think, or at least sure. not for all five of them. Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, because like I guess keep in mind, two of these dudes were army vets. So if they were competent enough to be in the army and serve in the army and be released from the army, you, you can drive an hour to a basketball game. Yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, Madru- it was Madruga's car that they took. Jack Madruga, one of the right. one of the army vets, um, and he, you know, obviously capable enough to drive a car and stuff. So yeah, it it sounded like these guys were. <laughs> fairly independent. I mean, sure. they held jobs, they, you know, had served, they owned cars, they got around independently. Right, right, right. They did things recreationally independently. It, it I don't know. It doesn't sound like they were uh too limited in in what they did on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, they they never came back Friday night. Uh by Saturday morning, the, the Yuba City or the Yuba County Sheriff is aware of the situation. And I think by Sunday, they start looking for the guys. Yeah. Um, by, well, I read Monday, you read Tuesday. Either, so either Monday the 27th or Tuesday the 28th. The char- So there's an article that runs down um, a little bit more about uh, Gary Mathias. Um, and in that one, they say that he, uh, that, that the car was found on the 27th. Um, the LA Times article has the 28th. Okay. Maybe it was in the middle of the night and somebody wrote it as, you so know, whatever. So the following either Monday or Tuesday, um, a forest ranger finds Jack Madruga's car, which the, the five guys had driven to the basketball game. It and, was a, uh, a Mercury Montego. Ooh. A 1969. A 1969 Mercury Montego. And it was white and turquoise, which sounds super fire for what it's worth. Ballin. I actually, I'm gonna gonna go ahead and do a quick good Google and moogly <laughs> of what that looks like because I haven't done that yet. So a forest ranger finds their car and it's abandoned on a gravel road near Orville, uh, which is in a camping area, um, about a two and a half hour drive from Chico, where they had attended the basketball game. It's located in the Plumas National Forest. Mm. Uh, the site where the car was found was at an elevation of about 4,500 feet. So they had driven up this gravel road um, into a mountainous, that is a fire automobile. I just turned a picture of the Mar- the Two, Mercury They had Montego. five guys in a two-door? Um, it Good ap- for them. It appears that, well, you know, bench seats back in the day and stuff. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose. Um, so they find the car. It's on this gravel road uh, near this, this campsite, um, sort of going up towards the mountains. Um, I mean, was, it was, it, I would say, not to cut you off, I was going to say it was like up it was up a mountain because it was right near the snow line, which if, okay. for for those of you who don't know, like in any sort of raising elevation, the snow line is essentially where it's cold enough, you're high enough elevation wise that there can be snow there year round. Yeah. I, climate in Northern California <laughs> in February. Do you know? Um, I don't know. Well, I think it changes because of the elevation, right? I mean, you can go snowing I'm saying, in those mountains, or I mean, you can go skiing in those mountains. Right. But like at... Sea level. Any idea? Mm, no. Okay. Not really. Uh, all right. So anyway, where they found the car and where they disappeared from, they were at 4,500 feet, and it was cold enough that there was snow on the ground. Um, and they were about two and a half hours off course had they just driven directly from Yuba City to Chico and back. Yeah. Um, and they were, this is to the northeast of where they should have been. Yep. The sheriff's report that there was no evidence of foul play found at the site of the car. Um, the keys were not with the car. Inside the car, they found candy wrappers and basketball programs from the game the night before. So they had indeed attended the game. There were also uh, local area maps 
uh, but they were in the glove box and had never been taken out or unfolded or didn't appear mm. to have been like there weren't open maps in the car. They were like right in the glove box, uh, seemingly unused. In the seventies, I would guess most cars had a map of the area in the glove box. For sure, for sure. But you'd um, think if these dudes had gotten lost, they might right. Have yeah, they didn't appear to have been yanked them out. Yeah, they didn't appear to have been lost or not super lost at least. Yeah, uh, the car was unlocked and. The passenger side rear window was rolled down. Yeah, that was a... I saw that too. That was a really weird specific detail. Odd, considering that it's below freezing where they found the car. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you're on the snow line, that means it's 32 degrees. Yeah, at, at most. Or less, yeah. Um, there was no damage to the car. There was about a quarter of a tank of gas. Right, right. And the car was not stuck. Um, it was kind of off to the side of the road, but it wasn't stuck in the snow or anything like that. Yeah. The, the one of the articles, the line I found was when the police hot wired the car, the engine started immediately, and they were able to drive it. Right. So it wasn't like they didn't apparently didn't abandon it because it was stuck or because the car shit the bed or, and we're done yeah, now. Yeah. 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 Um. So yeah, three days, three four days after the guys go missing, the Yuba County Sheriff finds the car. Um. And after that, they started a search in the area for these for these men right um over the course of about five days however shortly after they started the search a very severe blizzard moved through which covered any potential tracks there may have been and also made it difficult slash impossible to just even navigate the area um they said in some parts it was like it was like three feet of snow that was, came down or something like that yeah it was like feet a bunch. of snow yeah. and you're dealing with uh, you know, some pretty steep inclines and just even moving around the area became almost impossible for after, sure after a couple of days. For sure. So the they did a, a five day search that did not return anything. They found no trace of, of the guys. Um I think it was at that point that they put out they started putting out missing posters and kind of canvassing the area. The local area. Yeah, to try and gather any sort of information, see if anyone had seen the men either that night or, or afterwards. And that did return a couple hits. Um, it turns out a guy named Joseph Sho- Shones, should we say Shones? I think it would be Shones. It's S-C-H-O-N-S. Okay. Um, we'll say Shones. Uh, had or thought he had seen uh these five gentlemen, uh, Ted and Jackie and Jack and William and Gary, uh, because he was actually on that same mountain road that the Mercury was found on the night that the boys went missing or were presumed missing that they never came on, home. On Friday night. Friday night. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> this guy, the story about this guy is a little wonky. But essentially, he was going up the mountain on Friday night to check on a cabin that he had in that area because he wanted to take his family up that weekend. So he was going to go up on Friday night, be like, is it clear enough for me to drive up here? How's the cabin? Are we in good shape for me to do it? Yeah. Um, and this was about 5.30 Friday night yeah, is what I read? Yep. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he's riding, he's driving up the road sometime like, yeah, in the evening. I would imagine it's getting close to dark at that point if it's winter time because it's February. Yeah, probably. Um, so this 55 year old dude driving a Volkswagen bug up a mountain. Is that what it was? <laughs> I bu- didn't, oh man, I didn't read that part. Driving a Volkswagen that bug up like a, a mountain. That sounds like a terrible idea. Yeah. Uh, especially when you're by yourself. Um, he got stuck in the snow above the snow line. So the boys, uh, the boys is such a weird word. The guys, I don't know. Um, the guys had stopped before the snow line. He was just a little bit past the snow line. And his Volkswagen, Volkswagen bug, as you can imagine, got stuck in the snow. The, wait, so the guy's car was not in the snow? They were not fully into, I mean, as far as I was able to suss out, they were below the snow line, but like within yards of it. Hmm. So they weren't okay. fully pulled into this, like the snowy area. Okay. But they were within sight of it, basically. Yeah. Um. So his car gets stuck. His, yeah. his, his bug He's that trying he was to trying to drive up further. a snowy mountain yeah. <laughs> big, shockingly got stuck. Big surprise here. Um, jo- Joey Shones, 55, is trying to push his car out of the snow that it got stuck in. And uh, What's the strategy there, by the way? 
<sighs> as, as one per, I mean, you, I guess you got to try what you got to try, but right. So you push the car, you put in in neutral, I guess. Yeah, but I would imagine if you're going up a mountain and you put your car in neutral, aren't you chasing it? Way that's what I'm saying. The what's what's the best case scenario? It rolls over you and you die, <laughs> like, or you push it off the side of the mountain. Yeah, or you get moving and then you quickly hop in it. Yeah, or... your ghost riding the whip to like try to get back in it. I'm I'm not sure how you win in that scenario. I don't really know, man. It's a good question. I he yeah. definitely did not win. If you'd like to continue the story, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Spencer knows the most important detail, which is that uh, in 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 Joey Schoen's efforts to push his car out of the snowbank that he was uh, in up the mountain, he had a heart attack. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, um, it's okay. He survived, which is how he was well, able to tell I mean, police he's, he's dead now. But well, yes, he, but he <laughs> he did not die up on the mountain. Um, he. He basically what he says, which man, good on you. I guess the uh, I guess the seventies were a different time. Uh, he he said he had a heart attack, so he went into his car and laid down. <laughs> I don't know what other alternative he would have had, though. I mean, I guess you don't have cell phones, right? I guess I mean at least you're gonna stay warm in the car. Yeah, it depends on how incapacitated you are. I don't know what a minor it, doctors confirmed at a later date that he did in fact in, uh, suffer a mild heart attack. I don't entirely know what the like type of symptoms that gives you once you've had one. Anecdotally, I've heard of people having heart attacks and not realizing that it was indeed a heart attack yeah, until like, much later. Sure, um, soreness or yeah, pain or, chest pain or shortness of breath or things like that that mm. aren't that don't totally incapacitate you, and then later, sure. uh, you know, if you haven't. EKG or something that may show up that, oh, you've had a mild heart attack. Right. So heart attacks, I guess all I'm trying to say is don't always incapacitate or kill you. Yeah. But yeah, he, he jumps back in the car with it running to try and stay warm at least because at that point he had, was not pushing his car out of right. whatever it was stuck in. Right. Um, and, he, and he decided to take a break, which I think is uh, is a good idea. So as they're looking for the Mercury and uh, and for the guys, uh, Mr. Shones ends up telling the police that while he was laying in his car with the heater on, that uh, in the night, basically, I think he was maybe intending to stay the night there or at least like recoup for so he, the foreseeable future. He stayed in his car overnight and then the next morning walked eight miles back to the, There's a, there was some sort of uh, like a... A motel or something at the at the bottom of this at the base of this road where he had also stopped for quote a drink on the way up. Nice. So some people have hypothesized that maybe uh, our guy Joey was not uh, operating at a hundred percent. Got it. Because he was the type of guy that stopped for a drink by himself at five in the afternoon. Dude, I've done that while so driving. Many, I've done that so many times. Well, <laughs> you've been you've been drunk before too. That's true. That's so, true. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, um, he, he he waited it out overnight in the car, survived, and then twelve hours after having a heart attack, walked eight miles back down this what road. A badass man. But yeah, around he says about eleven thirty, <laughs> another or he said initially he said two cars pulled up the road behind him. Well, first he said he heard. He, what he described as whistling noises coming up the road. And so he got out of his car and said he saw what looked like a group of men and a woman with a baby walking yeah. in the glare of a vehicle's headlights and thought he heard talking. He said he yelled for help because he's like, hey, I just had a heart attack and my car stuck. Can you guys help me? Uh, but the lights went out and the talking stopped. He estimates that... Um, they were about 50 yards away. So, so 150 feet. The um, LA Times article has something slightly different. Holler at your boy. In that article, he's quoted as saying he saw two sets of headlights, one of which he was pretty sure was a pickup truck. Mm. And he saw people get out of the cars and leave in the truck. So there were two cars that drove up and that they left together in one pickup truck interesting but he also then later says i had a heart attack and i was half quote i was half conscious not lucid hallucinating and in deep pain he said well damn whether i half saw or half imagined the second vehicle i don't know Hmm. 
but he said he was certain about seeing the mercury. Interesting. Okay. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know why why my version has a little bit. I'm 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 reading from the Wapo version, so yeah, it's it's. I've had a hell of a time trying to find consistent information about any of this stuff because it just wasn't really covered. Yeah, this has another set of lights, but they refer to it as uh, as Shones saying that he saw flashlights later on. Okay, but because I think that do you know when when that uh, Washington Post article was dated? Uh, the WAPA article came out on July 6th of 1978. Okay. So maybe this this LA Times article was within a week of them disappearing. Got it. Um, so maybe six months later he had, or five months later, he had changed his story to leave so. out the part about being half awake and seeing another car. Yeah. Or things had just developed a little bit more in general or something. Yeah. Anyway. So he sees, for sure sees their Mercury. Yep. Possibly this actually, another car. This po- version of the article actually says that at one point, um, or not at one point, but the next morning, he remembered walking by the Mercury on his way back down to the hotel that you were talking about. Oh, right, because it would have been parked behind him on the right, same road. because it hadn't been moved. So yeah. he, he remembered seeing, I think that might have been what triggered his whole, I got to hit the police up, because he was like, yeah, I saw that car up on the mountain, because okay. I'm sure that may have been... <laughs> One of, if not the only car he saw on the mountain. And, and that would have been in a, I'm assuming, more lucid state. And, well, he would have been so sober. And in daylight, at least. And less pain, and yeah, and, and in daylight. Yeah. I mean, so, supposedly. Mr. Shones saw for sure their car, maybe them, maybe another car, maybe another person with a baby. And just to point out, or just to maybe reiterate, this is... 70 miles and a couple hours away from like anywhere these dudes should have been. Right. And according to their families, not an area that any of them were familiar with. Yeah. Either. Everybody was like, they're like, I think one, maybe, maybe one person said that Jim Weir had like gone fishing with his dad in the Plumas National Forest when he was like a kid. But that was literally the only moment of familiarity and it would have been 20 years prior like like not in any way that would have made valuable sense so in addition to shown's reporting that he had seen them and the and their car um there were a couple people in let's see if i can find in brownsville which i uh, it says it's adjacent town right well it says it's about an hour away by car because, oh wow! Yeah, so I don't think it's that far in terms of distance, but it's a lot of back roads and uh, uh, elevation changes and stuff to get there. Got it. So yeah, it says it's about an hour drive. Um, and there was a woman in town there who said that she saw all five of the guys on both Saturday and Sunday. So that oh, would have been the twenty really? fifth and the twenty sixth. Yeah. Um, I didn't. Okay. I read something about this, but I didn't know that. So she reported seeing all five of them and a red pickup truck on Saturday and Sunday in Brownsville. Um, She owned a like a a convenience or grocery store there, right? And she said two of the men came in to buy food. One of them made a phone call from the phone booth in front of the store, and the other two stayed in the truck. Um, which would imply that somehow. They came back down from where Shones had seen them on the mountain and were in this town an hour away, at least 48 hours later, which when we get further into the story is going to seem even more bizarre. Yeah. Especially when you think about the fact that they're, you got five dudes in a two seater with a rear bench seat. Their car stayed up there. Right, so if, if they're seen, and it, it ties in with Sean said he saw, at least in the LA Times article, said that he saw another vehicle that he thought was a pickup truck. Right. So now, getting five adult men into a pickup truck would already be pretty tight. Some, you're not riding in the back in February. Yeah, it's winter. And then... There would have had to have been a driver in the first place. Whose vehicle is it? Right. right. So you're looking at six people in a pickup? In February? That sounds highly unlikely, but... Right, and then this woman saw the five of them not with anyone else, so now 
where did this pickup where'd come they get from? The pickup, right? Someone else must have seen them during that time. You would think. You would. Um. So those were the only two reports I could find of anyone having seen them after they left uh, on Friday to go to the game. Yeah. I did think it was odd that no one, you're putting all this information out. I never saw one thing about anyone reported having reported them being at the game on Friday. Um, that's an interesting question. But didn't you say they had the they had the basketball pamphlets from the game in the car? Yeah, it said the the LA Times article said that they found like a program from the game in the car. So they I mean, so they went. I mean, they would have to go. That'd be the only way to get that. Yeah, I guess. I mean, but, it's a good it's I mean, a good question. Like did they even make it to the game itself? But Well, or I was also thinking, did they leave the game with someone that they didn't go with? Oh, sure. You know, did someone at the game see them? Oh, yeah, I saw them leave with a woman with a baby, for instance. Right. You know, or I'm just trying to think of any reason why they would have gone that far. Because, so they drove 50 miles north to the game. Yeah. Then they went another 50 miles further north, like in the opposite direction of home. It wasn't like they were even on their way back to home oh shit i don't even think i realized that with the map so they they started in yuba city drove 50 miles north to chico and then where their car was found was another at least 50 miles northeast of chico Uh, so they were going in the total opposite direction of where they should have been dude that is wild which leads me to I'm, i'm just thinking did someone at the game see these guys who it's hard to say but maybe they were visibly uh disabled or you know if you're sitting near them it may be apparent that they at at least some of them are disabled right does someone at the game see that and try and take advantage of that yeah there's um a couple a couple of like the takes that i've seen on in some of the comment boards and stuff like that are people it's like it's so awful that this is even like a trope in our society but like people trying to take advantage of people who are mentally disabled in some way like Mm-hmm. is awful but yeah it's definitely i guess a possibility i want to come back to that later though so okay. uh they they find the car they talk to shones and this woman who owned the store whose name i could not find who reports seeing them on saturday and sunday but their search on the mountain turns up nothing yep uh there are no clues to be taken from from the car and they have to kind of give up the search because they can't make any progress due to the weather in the area. Right. Um, and for four months, there are no developments. No one reports seeing them. Nobody hears from any of them. Nothing is found in the area where they went missing. Right. Until, I believe it was June, correct? Do you know this, the actual date? Yeah. Um... So oh, sorry, real quick. Yep. Uh, Gary, who had schizophrenia and was being treated with medication. Yep. Uh, his dad said that he required medication twice a day to manage it. Yes. And that quote, if he didn't have his medication for a few days, he'd be in very rough shape, talking to himself and such. Yeah. End quote. Um, so and he had not brought any of said medication with him because he was planning to come back with that the same intention night. of never yeah. needing to. Yeah. yeah. I think actually we should take a super fast break here, but when right. we come back, we're going to talk oh, about, yeah, uh, June 4th of that same year. Once the snow has melted, some people found something. All right. We'll be back in a second. We'll be right back. This episode of the What If Podcast is brought to you in part by Button Poetry. Check them out right now by visiting buttonpoetry.com. Button Poetry is nothing like the traditional poetry you heard in high school, and they're certainly not the same old boring dead guys that are going to put you to sleep. Button Poetry features poets of all ages, races, sexual orientations, and backgrounds. As a poetry press and online destination for spoken word and slam poetry videos, Button Poetry publishes poetry that moves people. They believe that real current stories and real current voices are more necessary now than ever. Everyone says changing the world with art is impossible, but at Button Poetry, they're sure going to try. So check out everything they have to offer by visiting them at buttonpoetry.com today. 
You'll fall in love with poetry all over again, or maybe for the very first time. I feel like we need like a, we need like, you know how talk show hosts have that person they throw to to be like comedic relief when they need to. We need someone to tell like a random knock knock joke when we're doing episodes uh, that are we, more yeah. intensive. When we do our missing people episodes once in a while. <laughs> and, yeah. and have existential crises. Yeah. Well, All right, guys. this one's not as weird as like the missing 411 stuff at least. Uh, no one talked about interdimensional Bigfoot. <laughs> In any of the articles I read <laughs> about any of it. <laughs> All right. So Fair. it's inherently less weird than Missing 411. Less weird, but maybe as scary. Yeah. Yeah, maybe worse. Maybe worse. Well, There'd at least be like a moment of excitement if you ran into interdimensional Bigfoot. Yeah. That's true. You would be. It would change a lot of things in I your mean, brain. I mean, you would then probably have a really bad time, but for a second at least, you'd be like, holy shit. I, it's real. It's real. Yeah. They were right. they were right. I bought some Bigfoot stock. June um, 1978. June 4th? June 4th, To be yeah, specific. So, so almost exactly three months after these dudes disappeared, the snow has melted. Oh, right. Three months in a, in a week or so. March, yeah. April, May, and then, yeah, just the beginning of June here. Um, so a group of motorcyclists, June 4th was a Sunday, said they're... Um, they're basically driving around uh, Plumas, the National Forest. Plumbus? Taking up What's that? Plumbus? Plumbus? What's a Plumbus? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Plumas, P-L-U-M-A-S, oh. is the National Forest um, that these guys are driving around in. And uh, they find a Forest Service trailer camp, which... Did you did you find any images of that by the way? No, I didn't. Did you? No, I was I was trying to to get an idea of just the, like the, the size, size and yeah. scale of what sort of thing we're dealing with here. Yeah, the 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 vibe that I get is basically in a national park there are places that um that Park rangers, people that look after the park can stay, you know, I don't know if they have like some sort of skeleton key where it works for the three or four different satellite locations they have or whatever it is. Um, but it like a trailer, like a, like an RV camper kind of thing. Okay. Um, but it's a permanent structure, right? Or semi-permanent? I would say semi-permanent because there was also, um, there's also a shed or like a, like a storage locker of some mm-hmm. kind. So like, I'm, I'm imagining like, Probably like fire pit, little camper, uh, storage locker. I don't know. I, like okay. kind of maybe a traditional like campsite for two kind of thing. Um, but I, I'm not. I I I didn't get the vibe from any of the things, especially because they continued to call it a, a trailer. They didn't call it. Um, yeah, but they didn't tra- call it like a, a lodge or like. But a, trailer could be small camper, or it could be. <laughs> large mobile home size trailer oh, oh well this says it was 60 feet oh okay so it was right. like a pretty big trailer okay cool. i mean like a, a very livable trailer i guess so anyway these guys are are biking and they find this trailer with a window smashed yeah. out yeah motorcycling around they were going to take five they found this little campsite they pop over the window smashed out and they got a real bad smell uh, near the trailer, and they decided that they should maybe call the police because mm-hmm. that seems sketchy. And so the police came with a report of the potential scent of a dead body. Mm-hmm. And inside of the trailer, they found Ted Weir, one of the four men. Uh, he was on the bed of the 60 foot long trailer. He had, uh, sheets, uh, pulled up and over his body and sort of tucked under his head or around him. They described it as a shroud. Yeah. Which which is kind of a weird word to use. mm -hmm. This just, this article I found just said it, it was just sheets. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, he had previously worn leather shoes the night that he left. Um, They were not on him and they were not with him either. Um, There was a table by the bed that he was found laying in that had uh, his ring, his necklace, his wallet with all the cash inside. 
and a gold watch, which all of the families of the men involved that night said did not belong to any of them. So mm-hmm. a watch that was not part of the group. Um, gets a little grisly here, folks, but we're going to do it. Um, he had been a tall and heavy set man, they said, 5'11", 200 pounds. Which I love, like, in the 70s, a 5'11 was tall and mm. 200 pounds was heavy set. I bet that's, yeah. like, very extremely average now. In America? Yeah, yeah. you're totally right. But yeah, he, um, when when he, he went missing, he weighed 200 pounds. And when they found him, he was 120? Yeah, they said 120 to 110. Um, so he had lost like 80 to almost 100 pounds. Uh, he had badly frostbitten feet. And they said that uh, the growth of the beard on his face showed that he had likely lived starving essentially, in the trailer for somewhere between 8 to 13 weeks. From the time that he went missing. Yeah. 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 Um, So the fact that he starved is very odd because, as you mentioned, there was that storage locker or storage shed uh, near the trailer. Right. Which had, it was uh, a year's supply of food rations in it. Right. Which so, I'm imagining they do like for the for the forest service guys if there is a blizzard and somebody get stuck for gets a few stuck, days. It's like yeah. you're good forever and we don't ever have to restock this thing. So it said there was a year supply of what they called sea rations, which I, I guess is a is an it's army a, it's a, a military, military term. Thing. Yeah, like MREs and stuff. Yeah, but C means that they're canned, pre cooked and prepared. So you can just crack it open and eat it. Right. As opposed to A or B rations, which require some amount of preparation. Sure. So there was a year's worth of edible food on the property that 36 of them had been eaten. So he clearly found them. And the oh, re- I didn't see that detail. 36 of them had been eaten and the, the packaging was inside the trailer and the, the rest of them were untouched. Whoa, I did not see that detail. I thought he had just not found the food at all. They f- it, he or they or whoever was there right. found it and only took whatever that would be, uh, a couple weeks worth of it. Yeah. And in, I, okay, so eight to 13 weeks is basically three, three months. Three or four months, yeah. So, okay, I mean, that would align perfectly with when they left, right? Yeah, well, that's actually kind of funny if you think about it. Because that would mean he had died very recently. Recently. Or very close to when he was found. Yes, based on his... Because to lose 80 pounds, I mean, even if you're losing a pound a day... Yeah. He would barely have enough time to do that, right? I mean, 80 days is about three, I mean, not quite three months... He was, um, that would mean you're just almost not eating yeah, for yeah, three months. One every two days or three days. Uh, it would be a, almost, a, if he lost 80 pounds oh, and he was yeah. only gone for about three months, he's losing almost a pound a day over that time. Oh, right. Yes. And I was, yes, sorry. I was doing different math. I was thinking if only 36 had been eaten, oh, granted, right, right, we, don't right, know, right, right. we don't know who ate them, but. If it was just him, he's only eating one every couple days. Right. Yeah, two a week or something. Yeah. Right. Right. So I it seems like he I don't know why you'd be rationing it that way. It doesn't make any sense. And then there was also um there was a propane tank connected to the trailer to supply heat and light. Which, and, to, and to make the stove work. Yeah. And and gas for cooking and it was never turned on but it was like apparently the way that they describe it is it was like outside i feel like if you're yeah but visible from enough, the trailer right i feel like if you're industrious enough to find Indu- huh if you're in if you are industrious enough as a person to find the food and open the food oh, and right. eat the food 
would you not have enough sensibility and industriousness to be like, oh, that's a pro paint tank attached to this trailer. Let's turn the heat on. And that and that's where the whole issue of like how able were these guys comes into play. Right. Because I, I maybe and then maybe that's not something he's familiar with. And then also who knows what sort of state of mind you're in at that point. Right. You know, your your health is probably very poor. You're the, in an extremely unfamiliar, life threatening situation. You may not be thinking clearly. And one of the it other, also brings into play the idea of Gary being without medication for a long time. Right. So if they were together, you have this guy who is typically probably uh, a leader of sorts for your group. Yep. Now off medication and full blown schizophrenic. Right. I I don't know how. I don't know how the other four guys would have reacted to that potentiality also. But the the trailer brings up so many questions. Like even because even if you don't uh even if you don't figure out the propane angle, yes. There were matches in the trailer that they said weren't touched. There was like cardboard in there that wasn't touched. There, there were yeah, they said there were books and notebooks and wood furniture and lots of things that could have been burned for heat. Right. And it he died from a combination of exposure and starvation. Right. Within arm's reach of, of both food and fuel solutions. and heat. Right. And there were, there were, and even if you don't figure out that, there was tons of clothing in the trailer. Oh, so you could have. There were jackets and blankets and stuff. Yeah. The, um, the article that I found said that when they found him in bed, he was wearing a velour shirt and lightweight green pants. It was the is, stuff that he had left the house in right. uh, in February. Because Weir's, uh, the, in the Times article, the um, Weir's grandma is quoted as telling him to wear a jacket and him saying, no, we won't need a jacket, I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, according to, this is again from the LA Times article, quoting the um, the forest rangers that were the first ones to go to the trailer. Yeah. Inside the trailer, this is directly quoting, heavy clothing, matches, playing cards, books, wooden furniture, and other combustible materials were strewn about, mm. yet none of the men were found wearing heavy clothing, and there had been no apparent attempts to start a fire. So it wasn't even that they couldn't find them or weren't looking for them. They knew they were there, moved them around, and didn't use any of it. I'm realizing now that I think we've missed one of the most important details about this campsite. What's that? That it was 19.4 <laughs> oh, yeah. miles. That's sort of important. Away from where their car was found. Yes. So this trailer that we've been talking about where they found, it was Ted, right? Ted Weir. In. Where they found Ted Weir was 19 to 20 miles in a straight line. As the crow flies, Nin so they 19 say. 19 miles from where their car was found. So it brings up, you're right, the, the biggest question of all of this is how the hell did he get there in the first place? Because you're walking, uh, presumably you're walking 19 miles through a blizzard in street clothes this to, to a destination that, again, in theory, you don't know is even there. Right. So if you walked in a direct line, it's 19 miles. If you're wandering through the woods. Right. Also. Running in circles. Also, it was at a higher elevation. So Yes, you, you're going uphill. Right, which A, makes that, that trip a lot more difficult and a lot slower. And B, doesn't make any sense. If you're lost, why would you head up the mountain? Right. This, this There's too nothing says, for you up there. If you're lost at elevation, mm -mm. you go down. Yeah. This says uh, four to six foot snow drifts were basically common in that area at that time. If you're, just to walk 19 miles would take hours. I mean, yeah, do, do the math. Like, you and I are healthy. In, Speak in for our, yourself, bro. <laughs> you're not feeling it? You're not feeling it today? Not feeling healthy today. But yeah, walking 19 miles. I mean, most people probably walk three to four miles an hour yeah. if you're just if you're walking down a sidewalk sure. in, in walking you know, around the lakes here not in Minneapolis uphill through whatever. a blizzard yeah so even at that pace you're looking at uh, five hours five hours best case scenario now add in four to six foot snow drifts add 4,500 feet of elevation add climbing uphill 
and add not being dressed for the weather. And you don't have a destination in mind. So it's 19 miles if you walked straight from A to B. There's but, no way you're going to do that because you right. presumably don't know where point B is. That's also that's also presuming that they just like walked and never hit a oh there's like a like a little cliff here we got to go around or we got to you I'm know saying. like right. oh that's a rock wall we can't climb up it or whatever. But how would they even they shouldn't have even known that they were going towards a destination. What would have even taken them in that direction or him or them or whoever it was right. in that direction in the first place? Which again sort of leads me to believe that there was someone else with them. Well, let's let's uh let's cover the them and where the them yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ended up so that we can get deeper into that world. Right. So after yeah. after Ted was found, they then Proceeded to search the area around the trailer, which makes sense. And now there was the snow had all melted, and the, the search was a lot easier. Yep. And they found three of the other men within within a couple miles uh, of the trailer, right? Yeah. So, um, Madruga, Jack Madruga, who owned the car uh, that they were taking together, and then uh, Jack was also the other army veteran. Mm-hmm. And then William Sterling, they were both found on the opposite side of the road from the actual camp itself. Um, but they were found about 12 miles away from the car. So, um, yeah, about about six to seven miles away from the trailer uh, itself. Uh, we're going to get back into the Grizzly again just for a second. Um, Madruga had been partially eaten by animals and dragged They'd about been outside in the elements for right, months. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, the I mean, the seasons had changed and yeah, they were um, all in much worse shape than, than Ted was. Right. Um, it says, uh, had been partially eaten by animals and dragged 10 feet into a stream where he lay face up. Uh, this is a direct quote from the times article, his right hand curled around his watch. Uh, Sterling was found, um, uh, in a wooded area and, uh, his bones were scattered uh, about in like a 50 foot area, uh, similarly close to, uh, Madruga. And then two days later, uh, same road that they have been on either side of so far. And again, the same road that they had, they been able to pass the snow line would have been where they were headed. Um, Jackie, Jackie Hewitt, uh, was found, but found, uh, Northeast of the trailer, um, which is actually where Sterling and Madruga's remains were also found. Um, Jackie, Jackie's bones were found, but strewn about in a much broader way than the 50 foot spread and much less of him was found. Um, all, all of this was attributed to natural stuff though, right? Like animals and, or the elements. I didn't really hear anyone's take on exactly the, what it was. The only stuff I could find was, uh, cause they did do autopsies on the guys to the extent that they could. Yeah. And it was that determined that they had died from exposure. So there were no indications sure. of uh, other injury or, you know, there were no wounds or blunt force, anything yeah. like that. Um, I would imagine if you're, but it would also, it would also imply that they'd been there a while. Which part? Their bodies? Yeah. Because As in they had died well, I'm just thinking to even, you know, animals moving, you know, decomposition and animals and all that stuff takes time still. For sure. And I mean, I think for even, much of it, it would have been, they would have been underneath the snow. Right. So. I think even three months worth of decomposition, especially in like decomposition obviously happens faster in warmer temperatures and colder temperatures. That's why we freeze bodies and freeze anything to make it not decompose faster. So having been at least for a month or so in the winter up there. That is kind of weird to me that, that some of those dudes had been taken down to bones in that period of time. Like that's either getting fully consumed by, you know, carrier animals, like, you know, fucking crows and shit. 
or bears or whatever, or yeah, I, I don't know. I it mean, makes me wonder too, if they at least had survived that initial blizzard that came through the following week. Yeah. Because otherwise you're under feet of snow where animals probably aren't going to get to you sure. and where you're, I would think you would be preserved better. Sure. Yeah. And that too, I guess it depends on when the snow melt happens, right? Like if, if the snow melt starts happening there on the 1st of May and then their bodies are decomposing for six weeks and the bears are coming out for the first time, you know, yeah. who knows they could have been preserved until then. Right. Um, so couple, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Just a couple, just a couple minor details, uh, related to that. So Northeast of the trailer was where Hewitt was found along with Sterling and Madruga. Uh, Northwest of the trailer, about a quarter mile away from where uh, where they were found uh, in the river and where Jackie's stuff was found, uh, his stuff, his bones were found, um, they found two forest service blankets and mm. a flashlight, independent of a person or a body, but about a quarter mile away from where Sterling and Madruga were. And Which would imply... That those came from the trailer, right? I mean, that would be my thought, which is... So at least two... It, it does seem like at least two, if not maybe all of them, made it to that trailer. Because... Yeah. The blankets made it out of the trailer. Right. And the the way that Ted was found makes it sound like someone else probably was there when he died. Well, so... I think the or one of the one of the more important and final details is you probably noticed we haven't said Gary Mathias's name and that's because Gary Mathias was never found no mm -hmm. no evidence of, of him was ever found except that Gary's tennis shoes were inside of the Forest Service trailer where Ted Weir was found. Mm. And Ted's leather shoes were no longer there, which means uh, oh. hypothetically speaking, both Ted and Gary made it to the trailer and Gary traded his tennis shoes for Ted's leather shoes. Mm -hmm. Um, also the, the autopsy on Ted said that he, it was not just that his feet were frostbitten, that it, they, he actually had gangrene on both feet, ugh. which the the doctor who did the autopsy, the pathologist said would have been even laying a sheet over them probably would have been incredibly painful, much less wearing shoes. I so can't that even I, imagine. I mean that would explain why he wasn't wearing shoes, but the fact that they got swapped. But also most likely you're not gonna cover I don't know, it, it they described it as if a sheet had been laid over him, like fully over him, over his head, over everything. Yeah. Which you're probably not, I and mean, maybe you would do to yourself in, I don't in know. your last, you know, whatever state of mind you're in right before you die of starvation. I, I, I have no idea what that I would be like. I was saying to off air that, like, when I'm, when I'm in hella cold mode, some days I'll just, like, pull the sheets over my head and, like, let my, let my exhales try to, like, yeah. well, and, warm and, up my bed, you know? I mean, who knows how your brain is functioning at that point. Right, but, right. Especially with guys whose brains we know functioned a little bit differently than but other I mean, people's and, brains. And anyone at the point where you are starving and or freezing to death, uh, right. your brain function is drastically, drastically different from what it would normally be. Right, completely. But it, it the way it was described in these articles did sort of make it sound like he had died and someone else had covered him. Yes. For whatever yeah, that's they, worth. They do make it sound that way. They're just sure. they're just a few things that don't conclusively prove that multiple people were there, but would certainly imply it. Yes. With the shoes being swapped, the I mean the, the place was a mess. Yeah. The blankets having been removed from there, but with Ted with Ted being found in the trailer itself means Someone else had to have been there to remove them from that place and bring them to that location. Probably, um, unless he had gotten to the trailer and then ventured out again. And then, but then, if you if you ventured out, why would you venture out? Drop the flashlight and blankets you brought with right. you, and then go back to the trailer. Right. Like that doesn't really make any sense. Right. So, four of the five men were found in or near the trailer. Gary Mathias was has to this day never been found. Yes. And there have never really been any leads, even as far as I could find. 
Not that I could find either, no. The only thing that comes up for his name is are these articles related to his disappearance and then a few missing people pages. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, let's let's dive into a couple of things that don't make any damn sense. Yeah, man. God, I mean, all of it make doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I mean, we we've we've been telling the story more than we've been pointing out specifically what doesn't make sense. But well, let's let's start from the beginning. Okay, the first thing to me that makes the least amount of sense is them driving north. Agreed. There, there should not have been any reason for them to be in that area at all. The only thing I can think of is, you know, they're at a college basketball game. Maybe they had a couple beers. They get on the road and they think they're getting on the south, whatever it was, the 105, and they got on north 105. And they're laughing and joking and didn't really think about it until 30 minutes later, somebody's like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, we fucked up. We went the wrong way. But with that... I agree. That's that's possible. However, you would pull out a map at some point. You'd think. You would You'd stop. At you a would gas stop station. at some point. Yeah. You would pull over and figure out where you are. Or I, you don't drive up a mountain. Yeah. Like that. That doesn't make any sense. And they weren't even. It wasn't like they were directly north on the same freeway. They would have had to make multiple turns. Right. And they would have spent a lot of time not on the on the freeway that would have taken them back towards Yuba City. Right. So I, you would have realized, oh, we're not even close to where we should be before driving for two plus hours. That's the other thing. It wasn't like the they were half an hour right. in the wrong direction. They were hours yeah, in the wrong direction over 70 miles they said yeah that's a long way to go making multiple turns and turning off of multiple different highways without realizing that you're going the wrong way so why do people go away from where they're intending to go and take multiple turns going in that opposite direction I'm, that's the first part of this that doesn't make any sense to me. The, well, to me, that was a semi-rhetorical question, but in my mind, the only the only thing I can think of why people would do that is because someone thinks they're being followed or they're being chased to some way. I mean, like to me, if you think you're being followed, you're going to start making turns and driving away from your intended destination to quote unquote lose whoever you're being followed with that, or you're going with someone who are following someone who's taking you somewhere. The, the one thing I was going to propose is maybe they're at the game They They meet somebody at the game and they say, Hey, we're going here afterwards. You, you guys should come with. Well, one, yes. And one of the things that I saw in one of the articles was, I think somebody said that like it was either Gary or Ted had friends in Brownsville. Okay. And someone was hypothesizing that maybe Gary had called ahead and said, Hey, we're going North. If you want to come down South to the Mm. game and meet us, we could hang out at the game. And someone was hypothesizing that like, maybe they were like, come back to Brownsville with us. And they wouldn't someone have come forward with that though. Well, so the cops was a friend of his, the cops talked to their friends and said that they were like, we haven't seen Gary in a year. Like we didn't hear from him. I mean, that's a phone record you could attract. You could have had a record of that phone call probably if he had called them recently. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, again, just speculation. Right. And I mean, all of this is, but it, it, I guess could be possible you meet someone at the game you know, the people you're sitting next to or in your section or whatever. And right. It's a Friday night and the game's done at 930 and you want to hang out afterwards. And you follow somebody and realize, oh, it's farther than we thought. Or you get separated from this person and pick a wrong it's, turn. It's 78. You right. can't look up where you are. You can't call them. You can't. You have no way of getting in touch with this person if you get separated. Right. And then... I don't know, maybe you turn off wherever you happen to be or you panic and realize you're way off course and don't know where you are. So I, 
I, I can come up with some semi-plausible explanations for how you end up over there. Right. Especially if it's some guys who maybe, I mean, again, we're purely speculating, maybe are e- more easily influenced. Yes. Or whatever. Um, but then, okay, so say you're following somebody and you get separated from them. Let's go with that. And so you get and lost you, and you inadvertently you ran off. up the mountain. Number two. Why are you driving up the mountain? Because they were eight miles from the base of that road. Sure. You drove eight miles up a gravel road, to, up a mountain into a national park at 10 o'clock? Yeah. 11 o'clock? Which it would have been pitch black. Obviously, that's not the park, way back no to anything. Right. That's the way up a mountain into a park. And this again, and this again to me is why, um, why part of me thinks that this is like the behavior of someone evading something or someone like that, that your, Mm -hmm. your, your desire to go up a mountain is counterintuitive, but it's counterintuitive in the way that like, if you were trying to evade someone following you, you would be doing some counterintuitive things. Yes. I have two, two problems that I see with that though. One being that, You've gone really far off your original course, yeah. and in the op- you wouldn't have even started in that direction. Yes, if you if you leave the game and you think you're being followed, mm-hmm. you would have at least started in the direction of home. You went in a totally different direction sure. for hours. Sure, and when they pulled off on this gravel road, if you look up a was it Mercury Montenegro or whatever uh, the hell Mon- it was <laughs> Montego, yeah, <laughs> Mercury Montego, Montego. It's a very it, the car sits very low. Mm-hmm. There were would have been five men in the car. Yep, that car would have been riding low as shit over yep. a gravel road. Yep, in the winter, and there was no damage to the car, so they were driving very carefully and or slowly. Yeah, they weren't like cruising. They didn't appear to leave the car in any real rush like they took their stuff with them yeah it wasn't like they pulled over and just all jumped out they took the keys they took their belongings with them for the most part yeah they stopped and this is the other thing that makes me think they weren't being pursued they stopped after the game and bought junk food yeah someone on friday night after the game saw them at a convenience store where they bought it was i think it was about 10 o'clock and we left this out earlier they stopped, and all five of them were there, and they bought, like, soda and junk food and stuff, and the rappers were in the car. Yeah. So they were they were grubbing down on their way back. On yeah, their so way it wasn't, it, it doesn't yeah, seem like true. it was a real urgent life or death type of situation. So then the other thing is, if there was two sets of headlights, like Joey Schoen saw after he had his heart and attack on the mountain. And said, maybe I didn't see, but yeah. He said he maybe didn't see him. It was a UFO. Uh, don't you dare. Don't you dare. <laughs> you get out of this room. I'll finish this on my own. Sorry. Um, Just fucking with you. There are no aliens in this episode. Um, do Were they following a car? Hey, we've got a cabin up here. Hey. Right. We've, I mean, this goes back to the potential of them maybe being seen in Brownsville the next morning or the next day or whatever it was like the next two days, the next two days, like, like did assuming they, that report is accurate. Right. You know, did they go, did they ditch their car and ride with some new, fr- I mean, it doesn't seem like something these dudes would do, but, and then, yeah. Why there? Right. Yeah. Why, why leave it up a mountain? Why would you leave the car? Why would you leave the window down? Yeah, that's a weird one too. It's not like they pulled off and parked the car somewhere. They drove eight miles up a up a dirt road and then right. just left it at an arbitrary point on the road. Right. So, yeah, and I mean, I could, I could see leaving the game with someone, following somebody back to a, a party or something, and getting off track. But then you abandon the car, and you, the reality you don't come is, back for two days. And, and then you all f- go find yourself climbing the mountain outside of the car in right. the clothes that you left in on so, Friday night. Like that can't make any that, sense. That then exactly that requires them a being with somebody else, b leaving with someone else from this arbitrary point, two and a half hours away from where they were. Right. And 
six people getting into a pickup, apparently. Yes. At minimum of six people getting into a pickup. Yes. Doing something for at least two days and then ending up back on the mountain. Yeah, returning up to that. And not not just ending up back on the mountain by your car, but ending up 20, 20. miles uh, vertically upwards from your car in the snow, which makes right. me, which makes me think that the, the woman who thought she saw them in town is just not, that's not really plausible to me that, that like, you know, when, when people yeah. say, oh, you know, there's an APB, a missing person and you run a convenience store off a freeway, you probably see a lot of people come through and you go, yeah, they, I think there was five guys in that car. Maybe there was four. I mean, eyewitness testimony is so right. The simpler explanation is that unreal. that woman's report is wrong. Yeah. Except it wasn't just one person either. It was at least two. It was two people, but yeah. they said they were in a car that they never left in, which is the weird part. Except then you also have Shown saying he saw their car and someone and else a, in a pickup. And a pickup. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it could definitely be false. I hear you. But I, it, even if, okay, so say they go up there on Friday night. Up the mountain? Yeah. Yeah. And Which obviously they did. And they're not with anyone else. It's just them. So then that makes the question of what the hell are they doing and why they why they're there even more strange to me because going that direction just the five of them now now you have no reason to be out there. So we we lose our possible explanation for why they're so far off course. Yes. And then why do you leave the car? If you're if you're stuck, if you're in bad shape, if you need help, why do you get out of the car that's not stuck, that isn't out of gas, that isn't, there's nothing wrong with it? You could start it up and you could drive back down the road. Right. And why do you ignore Shones when he yells at you? Well, okay. So I have kind of a theory about that. And then we're still at why are you going out into nowhere? So, You're going 20 miles up a hill yeah, for but, no reason. Okay, but think about it this away way. Away from the one thing that can get you out of whatever situation you're in. Think about it this way, though. Imagine, well, skip all the setup. You and I are driving up a mountain in the middle of the night, and we like... For hit, just whatever reason? For just, whatever reason. Okay. And we hit the snow line, and we're like, oh, damn, Like we should get out and check out the snow line. I don't know if we can actually push it further than this. You mm -hmm. know, like... We were going to get some very dope northern lights and or moon pictures, but maybe not anymore because we can't drive past the snow line. Okay. So we get out to like examine the snow line thinking we're literally the only motherfuckers on this mountain and 50 feet away, there is a disembodied voice where the, I mean, you're talking 50 yards. So very plausibly dude doesn't have the lights on, on his car. You can't hear it running. You wouldn't even see it per se. But you just hear from way far away, hey, ah! like I would be like, get me the fuck out of here. In your car, though. You don't well, run right, further yes. up the mountain and leave your car. Yes, but if the leader of your squad is a schizophrenic dude, her But mate, he's not at that point. Well, he. but we don't know. We don't know how great. Maybe it was. Maybe it was 1130 in his in his evening dose was supposed yeah. to be taken at six or seven. I mean, again, like I'm. This is all speculation. But he I'm was just driving, saying, like, was he not? No, I don't think so. It wasn't his car. Oh, right. It right, was Madruga's right. car, no, so right. I would imagine Madruga was driving the whole yeah, time. You're right. You're right. Um, okay, so you run away from the car because you're scared. Because because you hear, I'm just saying, you like, keep going for 20 miles. No, but you might go for one mile or two miles, and then in a panic because. One of you was like, oh, fuck, run. And you all went, oh, fuck, run. And everybody <laughs> ran. You know, like, I mean, we've all been into a point where, like, I mean, we were all at a party at some point when we were 18 or 19, and somebody went, oh, fuck, the cops. And everyone else went, oh, fuck, the cops. <laughs> and everybody ran. And and nobody knew what they were doing or why they were doing it. And you left your cars, and you just started hopping fences. And, like, you, and you might have gotten far enough away, like, if we were in in – our cities that we grew up in, we'd go, okay, I know how to get, take this road back to this road, back to this road. But if you ran into the woods to be like, let's get away from that scary voice. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, I don't know where I came from anymore. Like that. I mean, 
Mm. But okay, I, I'm not trying to devil's advocate for this because then the, your your other reality holds true. You got two dudes who are in the army, and I don't know how much stuff they teach you in the army. It's not nothing. I, it's not nothing, and I know that what it definitely isn't is. Okay, so when you're lost in the woods in the middle of the night, just keep climbing upwards. Right. Like, you should have been able to, if you walk down, just walk down, you're either going to get to the road that your car is on. Right. Or you're going to get to the base of that mountain. Right. And you're going to know where you are. If you walk down, you will eventually figure out where you are. Okay. Which is also way easier. Yes. And way shorter. Yes. They could have at least realized, oh, we're less than a third of the way up this. Don't go the way that's, we don't know how long, but longer and way more difficult and treacherous. We know, well, we know that we know that to go back down from where they parked their car would have been eight miles because that's what Joey right. Shones did. Which and we know driving that, in an unfamiliar area at night, you probably don't have a good sense of that distance, but no, you but, could, you get back to the road and you figure it out. Yes. Take the road back. Don't go into the wilderness. Right. I mean, I guess we And also... <sighs> the road that they parked the car on, we know is the road that eventually connected upwards, so we don't know that they didn't continue on that road. But that would have made it even longer. It would have made it longer because it was a wraparound. Now and, we're looking at 30 miles. And, you're, and it wouldn't Which have, would have taken a full day to, to walk. Sure, and it also wouldn't have been... Like, you're going up... You're going up again in four and six foot drifts of snow and, on a road. And if, okay, so you take that road up. Say you, for whatever reason, you follow that road up. Without a jacket on. But, okay, you make it there. You make it to, you walk this road all the way up and you find this trailer. You know exactly how to get back down. Yeah, because you just did it. Right. You follow the road back down, you right. get to your car and you leave. Right. Right. So then the and also only if you found that camp, even if you didn't take the road to get to that camp, if you went through the woods to get to that camp, that camp was off a road. It right. wasn't just like they didn't just stumble upon it in the middle of the wilderness. Right. I mean, they right. had to have, I would imagine they climbed, found the road at some point or took it all the way up and then got to that camp. So let's, let's go with this then. Let's say Shones startles them. Yes. And for whatever reason, they decide, which is, this is not pl very plausible to me, but they decide that, We're like hell! <laughs> yeah, that we need to abandon our only safety here and leave our car and just get the fuck away from this ghost. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, uh, we'll I, I'm saying wait, it's not super plausible, but thing. let's just go with it. Let me say one thing. This may be uncouth, but a guy who's schizophrenic, a guy who's considered slow and three dudes who are developmentally developmentally disabled who found themselves up on top of a mountain in the middle of the night and are probably pretty cold and heard a disembodied voice on the road may not have made the most logical and rational decision that For you sure. or I would have sure. made. I'm saying, and that's what I'm saying. Let's go with that. Okay. I'm just saying like, I like, even though you're like, I don't, you're saying like, I don't know what reason it could be. And I guess I'm just trying to say like that might in its own way be a reason. Sure. I don't think it's likely. It's possible. Yes. So let's go with that. All right. They just, they run like hell from wherever they left the car. Okay. Can I just, I'm sorry. I got to say something again. Me in my healthiest state, I'm a 30 year old dude. I'm like, I'm not, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. I've been biking a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably down after at like, maximum 10 miles right in four again i know i've said this a bunch but four foot and six foot snow drifts without boots some of these dudes were in fucking tennis shoes yeah and i don't have a, a winter coat on i don't have gloves i don't have a right. hat on so i'm let down me, let me let me follow this line though. okay go is it possible that they for whatever reason got startled they got scared they left the car and then the reality of the elements sets in. So maybe only one out of the five of them makes it to that trailer. The other ones, we're assuming maybe made it there and then ventured out or they were together. Maybe four out of the five of them died that night on the way up. Well, we know at least two of them made it there because of the shoe swap and because the blankets that got taken back out. We don't for sure, though. Because it could be, let me just, let me just, 
Hold on a second. I'm listening. Let me go down the line. No, I'm listening. Okay. The five of you leave. And you're just, let's say they're following the road. Yes. That would be more logical than just running off into the woods. For sure. And four of you, you die. You you pass out or you fall over. Or you're, you, you're tired. You sit down. You fall asleep. You don't wake up. Yeah. Whatever. It is technically possible that Ted could have, uh, whose shoes did he have? Um, well, he didn't have any, he had, uh, but whose were in the trailer? Gary Mathias's shoes were in the trailer okay. and so maybe, Ted's maybe, shoes were never recovered, assuming they're with wherever, uh, Gary landed. Right. So maybe Gary goes down, Ted swaps shoes with him and leaves his there and he keeps going towards his trailer. And the other guys either make it to the trailer with him or don't. It's possible that Ted was the only guy who reaches this trailer. And then at some point, he ventures out either to see if he can... I mean, it's also possible that these guys got separated at some point. So maybe maybe he ventures out to either try and find the other guys, find a way out, find any sort of other outside help. He takes those blankets with him. He gets out there and obviously shit doesn't work out and heads back to the trailer. And by the time he's back at the trailer, he's his feet are frostbit and he's near the end and not no longer functioning in a, in a rational way. He, he tears the place apart, isn't thinking clearly and just lays down to die. Yeah. I'm not saying, yeah, okay. I'm saying that's that's as close as I can get to a rational explanation, and there are still tons of holes because he lived for three months. Yeah, he was alive for a while. Months. At a minimum, they say eight weeks. That's two months. No, I know. I'm just saying, at a minimum, he <laughs> yeah. was there for two. two right. whole he months. lived long enough to lose eighty pounds. Okay, let me throw another line at you, and then we don't. Like Gary just disappears into the ether. Yeah, the Gary never ever being like the fact that they were able to find all these dudes and find their. I mean, literally one dude was. This is again kind of grisly, but uh, Jackie Hewitt's father insisted to join the search party, and he found his own son's spine. Yeah, and they found like five or six of his bones, and then they found his jaw, and they were able to confirm through dental records that it was him, but like. I guess the point I'm trying to make is they weren't like just finding full corpses of people. Right. They were finding like. Except for Ted. Except for Ted. Yeah. Uh, And also I think um, Sterling who had been pulled into the lake was more fully formed. Um, But like they were finding like small bones of these dudes within a 10 mile radius like of each other. I mean. Is it. Is it. Is it possible that they stepped out of the car for whatever reason, and encountered, startled a, a group of bears or something like that, that like that night right away had some sort of animal encounter that either would have caused them to split up or just run like hell. Like like you... And maybe Gary got nabbed by one of them and that's why he's never been found. Well, it, it did cross my mind that... Um it did cross my mind that there's a possibility that even though the car was functional, like, I mean, seventies cars could like, could die. You know, it could like, you could be driving up a hill and it might just like take a shit on you for a second. Or you're driving up the hill and a fucking grizzly is crossing the road. That, but if there's a grizzly crossing the road, you're not getting out of the car and running, but you might, unless it comes towards the car. Well, that's real, but but you also you also might I'm saying like even though the car was perfectly drivable when the cops found it, it might have you know, it might have like for some reason just died on them for a second and they might have like paused or, on the road up, gotten out to check it out and or that's weather when, conditions change and they were stuck then, but oh three days later it wouldn't have been. Yeah. You know what I mean, like right. maybe maybe they encountered some mud or some snow or something that then right. by the time the car was found it wasn't had melted or yeah. dried up or whatever. For sure. Or it just yeah, it wasn't as slick as it would have been or whatever. Mm-hmm. I I mean, yeah, I, I guess that it's possible 
I think also a thread of this that is like probably not a super popular one, but I still think it's possible is talking about Bigfoot. I'm not talking about interdimensional oh. Bigfoot. <laughs> okay, sorry. Get, yanking people into the bushes. <laughs> gotcha, bitch. <laughs> gotcha. Um, is it possible? Is it possible that so one thing that we didn't exactly say about Gary, Gary Mathias, who was a former army vet, uh, had been um, discharged, I believe, yeah, from the army because to, I think due to me- mental health reasons, correct? Because of his mental health assessment after he had assaulted people and well, I didn't had, know that part yeah he had been arrested for assault on a base or on on a deployment or something like that okay and then he had two like two further incidents that basically was like I think his whatever three strikes in the army and they were like hey man you gotta go now um that was and that probably stemmed from mental health because he was not being treated at the time right yes exactly okay. and I think that's what led him to be discharged get a mental health diagnosis get diagnosed with schizophrenia and then start taking medicines for his schizophrenia. But I do think there's something to be said for as a guy who, I mean, you know, yes, like they said for two years, he had been regularly taking his medication and his schizophrenia was totally under control and he was like working a job and like everything was cool but is there a possibility that a dude with a violent history who has schizophrenia, if he if he lapsed or didn't take his medication or or forgot for a couple of days or whatever, you know, is that is it possible that that guy could have derailed some a, a group full of people with uh with developmental disabilities that where he could have said. We're being followed. We have to go this way. Someone's telling me to go this way. We should that check is, it out. That is definitely some. Paranoid, schizophrenic line of thinking. Right. Like we got to go up the mountain because someone's behind us and maybe mm-hmm. they're not at all. And then when they get out, Joey Shones yells at them from up the road. Which confirms their delusion. Which confirms the fact that the paranoid schizophrenic dude is like, oh shit, someone's trying to get us. And he's like, fucking run, run into the woods or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden they're, you know, they're going whatever. And it still doesn't explain though why none of them would come back. Because yeah. it would, it, you would think after hours or a full night of that, you would at least make a move back towards the car, the road, safety. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I'm, you would. I mean, I think. But that, again, it, it's it's assuming that people are thinking rationally. Yes. But I would think one out of the five of them would be at least. I was. I learned. Uh, I'm reading. Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. And there's a section in that where he talks about practical intelligence as it relates to IQ scores and how people with lower IQ scores are sometimes tested with a practical intelligence test. That is, what is the uses of this object? Give me as many uses of this object as you can. And that often people who have uh, lower IQs, and I mean like in the world of developmental disabilities, mm-hmm. lower IQs, can't imagine uses for things beyond what they are. So like you and I would look at a book and go, it's fucking paper, you could burn it and you could start a fire. Right. Whereas someone with an IQ in like the 50s and 60s might look at a book and go, no, I couldn't. It's a book. Uh, it's a yeah. book. That's you, its purpose. You read them, yeah. Right. It, it, wouldn't, but it wouldn't cross their mind that- Matches? That's their purpose. <laughs> Yeah. A stove? Yeah. That's its purpose. For sure, for sure, for a sure. jacket? Like, I, there there were plenty of things that you wouldn't have had to be very creative about. Yeah, to be more comfortable. No, that's true. I guess I was just trying to find a way that maybe some of those, um, some of those, you know, some of those elements of logic and reason may have been absent, mm-hmm. just like straight up absent from the decision-making process that... But again, that it wasn't, that wasn't all of them either. No, no, that, yeah, and that's the other thing. Again, like, two, I mean, one dude, you know, discharged, but, like, two Army veterans, we're talking about survival Some amount of survival at skills. This point. Yeah. And, uh, again, you can, I mean, if, we, if we're really looking for answers, you could say maybe dude had, uh, Gary, right, was the guy with schizophrenia? Yeah, Gary Mathias yeah. was the, yeah. Maybe he had some sort of break or some sort of episode, but yeah. even then... That doesn't explain the behavior of, of the other guys. And there's no reason to think that he would have that night. I mean, there's there's no 
the rest of that yeah. day, the the years prior to that, he had not. Nothing seemed that way, yeah. And so it would be awfully inconvenient for that ha- to happen just in that one moment out of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of days. I have a question for you. Yeah. If you do not turn on the heat or start a fire in a camper Mm -hmm. 5,000 feet above sea level in winter on a mountain, how are you alive for eight weeks? Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I, that, like, I, I actually the timing of it makes no sense to me. I biologically feel like that's not possible to stay alive in those. T- like you would die at night. It, I mean, even it, I would think so. You or I, if 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 we were to go outside in Minnesota in like November and it was like eighteen degrees and we just slept on a bed outdoors, like there was a broken window. I mean, right. There's air coming in, like... Well, and there's nothing heating it other than your own body heat inside anyway. Yeah, like, you're going to die. I don't understand I would, I would how think you so, would yeah. stay alive for eight weeks even to begin with. Right. I I totally agree. But he clearly was there. He was clearly there. He was clearly eating. He was clearly Well, going, he wasn't, which well, leads me to believe eating. that he was there. Sort of eating. Because... I, uh, and him not being there doesn't make any more sense, because then how did the wait Gary not being there? You're saying the, uh, any of them? Yeah, I think they all most likely were up there the whole time. I don't think they probably left after that Friday night where they first went up there. Let's, but I, I I'm with you. I don't know how you and I don't know the exact climate. But if it's cold enough for there to be feet of snow on the ground, it's cold enough it's to die of exposure. A hundred percent, hundred percent. After months, right. I mean, I, again, there there are just so many parts of this that don't add up at all. Um, I have one more thread or, like, possibility. Okay. Is it possible? Okay, so take the two-car theories back and allow for the two-car theory. Yep. Is it possible? You're saying in addition to Shones, so yes, that someone else was with the five men. Shones' report of seeing two vehicles. Yeah. Let's just say for for our purposes, it's not a it's not a pickup. It's a it's something else. It's something that like more comfortably fits these dudes. Okay. Is it a possible van or something? Yeah. Is it possible that they're joyriding with some friends that they meet? They're like, let's go check out the view up at the mountain, and whatever. Let's say the Montego does take a shit. Whatever it is, like it just or dies it in the cold, or, or yeah, yeah, in a way that was not obvious later. The Montego takes a shit. And mm-hmm. they're like, well, shit, we're up here. Snow line's there. Like, fuck it. Let's just go back down for the night. We'll we'll come back and get the car later. Is it possible that a third party is involved in taking them back down and, like, housing these dudes for the night and, like, taking them back up the mountain and, like, maybe dropping them off somewhere? Where yes. they're like, oh, yeah, well, you can just drop us off here. We'll go get the car and then all of a sudden they're like, oh shit, it might be daylight. And they're like, this looks different. Did we pass the car? Where's the car? But that's, and then, that, then you're still stuck with the same set of problems or the same set of unexplained things as you are if they're up there on the on the first night. Because that doesn't then... Uh, it that accounts for some of it, though. It doesn't account for them going up the mountain. It doesn't account for them being... Joyriding, the, getting a, get, getting no, a cool I'm, view. I'm saying so, okay, they go up there. They leave that same night, that Friday night at midnight. Yes, with someone else, some yes. third party that they they met at the game are familiar with. It. Yeah. Okay, then on which would also explain people seeing them in town Saturday Sunday. Yep. So say they go back up there on Sunday to grab the car. Yep. From that point on, it still doesn't explain anything. Well, I guess you in my still head, climbed twenty miles up the mountain. You but, still got separated. You still didn't eat any of the food you still didn't make yeah sh- shelter and heat and i guess what i my, my thought was maybe i guess this sounds illogical but like maybe they blew by the car and they like dropped them off higher up the mountain than when they originally started or something like that or i don't know yeah and then and then they were like but the car was found just like on the road you would have right. had to go right past it right and then still you're just gonna drop. You're just whoever's taking them up there is just gonna leave them and say, "All right, yeah, go die." Yeah, 
That doesn't it make any winter, sense. It is winter, but uh, carry on. I'm going to leave you on the top of a mountain. Yeah, no. I, yeah, I don't know. I, and then there was a. they called off the search because of the conditions. So they somebody wouldn't have been able to drive up there. They couldn't, they couldn't yeah, get ATVs blizzard, like, the next through. Week, right. They had to call off the search because the weather was so bad. Right. I don't know, man. There's not a good. There's not a good tie off on this whole thing. Let's. Uh, should we take one more quick break? Yeah, I mean, we sure. What do you mean? <laughs> We're just long as hell already, but yeah. Uh, let's take one more quick break, and we'll come back with some final thoughts. Cool. This week on what if you never came home? <laughs> Lee. <laughs> oh, we'll be right back. We want to hear from you. Send us a message. Email hi, that's H-I, at whatifpodcast.com. Or leave us a voicemail at 612-246-4614. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. (laughs) We're almost done, bro. You Um, you can leave in a minute. No, that's not what I mean. (laughs) I don't mean I want to go home physically. I mean, I just don't ever want to be in this situation. Yeah. And it's, scary. I, it's, I think it's scariest when the, there's no logic or reason to it. Cause you can't like 40 years later, there's no resolution right? of any kind. Like it's heart it's heartbreaking to imagine. I mean, it really is. It's genuinely heartbreaking to imagine a schizophrenic guy and for someone, oh, dude, developmentally disabled dudes wandering in the wilderness trying to you know like whatever happened it was horrible for them horrible yeah awful and and it's and i think it's such a mystery because there's just such a vast lack of logic and reason to like we i mean we we didn't even intend to go through it this way but we went through like every step of the of the process and we're like and why this and then why this and there really isn't a good i mean at one, but more likely several of those points, something that just doesn't make any sense happened. Yes. Or something that no one is considering for some reason. Right. And, and obviously, I don't know what that would be, but. Yeah. I mean, I know we are, we're often like, we are, we are wants to bring, uh, bring other elements into some of these stories, but. And I'm kind of amazed that. No one has gone that route with this one yet. Yeah, then no one was like, it's definitely well, Bigfoot. I, I don't know where they are, but I did see some orbs by the mountain that yeah, night. Yeah, yeah. I haven't heard any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. It uh when I came across the Reddit thread, some people or the, the original poster was comparing it to uh the Dyatlov Pass incident. Yeah. And there are I mean it's not exact by any means, but there are some kind of odd similarities to that event. Yeah. Mostly just in terms of how unexplainable it seems to be. And also for sure, if if you guys haven't um if you guys haven't heard about Dialov Pass, uh you should go find a podcast called Astonishing Legends. Yeah. They did probably the most thorough breakdown of this incident I've ever heard. Yeah. Um the- it's a fascinating take and they did a lot of research it's uh, episode 23 of Astonishing Legends. Um, it's they, a multi-part of yeah, it, Yeah, episode 23 is the first one. I think it was a three-part. Okay. Um, we'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, the, just super, super quick summary of the Dyatlov Pass incident. There was a, um, a group of uh, hikers in the Soviet Union in the 50s who went on this expedition in the Ural Mountains and uh, never came back. They, and they were just all sorts of weird. They were all found dead later. Um, Again, once they were up in the mountains, so they had to wait until the snow melted so they could even access the area and then find them. Um, And there was never an explanation for what happened to them, how they had died, um, why they had left their camp. Uh, They cut their way out of their tent. Some of them had climbed up in trees. Um, Some of them had sustained significant internal injuries as if they had been like crushed. They had broken ribs and crushed internal organs and things. Um, 
one person had like part of their face and tongue missing and just yeah. all sorts of really really odd stuff that has never Gruesome been and... yeah even even the uh the official report about it excuse me the official report about it blamed some unknown compelling force was the yeah. quote for what had happened um and people people have obviously speculated all kinds of things anything from uh, some sort of Soviet military test that that went wrong to animal attacks to there's one hypothesis about infrasound, which right. is um, sound waves below the range of human hearing, so very very low frequency sounds, and they can like distort human behavior basically. Yeah, so and thinking and... there there's been some research around infrasound that has shown it can um, exposure to really loud, really low frequency sounds can have physical impacts on a person right. um, and also change your mental state. Yeah. Can so like Loki drive you crazy kind of. You can feel very anxious. You can, it's uh, capable of inducing panic attacks in some yeah. people. So there was one hypothesis that this mountain pass and the wind may have created this infrasound sort of vortex that they happened to set up camp in and they were all kind of driven mad throughout the night. Yeah. Still doesn't explain how they died. No, or yeah, there's a lot to why that one too. They would have been climbing trees and how people got crushed and had their tongues ripped out. But completely, um, I think. So yeah. Anyway, if you're not familiar with the Outlaw, it's a fascinating story. I, I would agree that the Astonishing Legends dudes did a probably the most thorough job I've heard of of covering the story and um some of the breaking down some of the various hypotheses around what might have happened. Yeah, and I think like the for me the biggest uh maybe overlapping characteristic would be the whole idea that like when faced with when faced with a daunting negative dangerous situation instead of acting in their own best interest which seems mm -hmm. blatantly obvious like blatantly evident the ways that you could and would act in your own best interest, they seem to continue over and over again to act against that best interest. Right. And that, and that it, to me is the really true shared characteristic of the two stories. Obviously there's other overlaps in terms of like it being in nature and it being in winter and there being, you know, some survival elements and dying mm -hmm. in the woods. Like there's a lot of that stuff that overlaps too. But the thing that really I think like ties it snugly together is that whole, like, why would you leave your tent? Like, why would right. you leave there's... your car? Why would you not eat the food? There was wood in their, in their tent, uh, in the DLL pass thing. Like mm -hmm. there's so many things that just are, they, they just boggle the mind because it's like, if you had only, done this right. you would have been fine and it was seems so evident that that would have been the thing you should do usually for any situation if you if you can see one person or multiple people's actions as a group you can figure out what they're reacting to sure or at least a plausible range of things that they might be reacting to sure so and in both of these cases there's nothing that that adds up no there's no one incident or one motivator that would inspire all of these actions. No. An animal attack might, might explain one part of it, but then it just raises a bunch of other questions. Right. Or, you know, in the, in the case of, of these five men that went missing, uh, you know, mental health issues may explain part of it, but then you still have... 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of it that it doesn't explain. Right. There's completely. no one thing that it would explain all of their of their actions. Right. And you would and you would think too that, like you said, you know, you can usually like find one uh, find one common thread. Or not one common thread, but you can you can find like one pillar that their behavior points to. You can to. find the point where things went wrong. Yeah. And I think with both Dyatlov and uh the Yuba incident, as I think, yeah, we're, we need to coin that. We're, yeah. we're deeming this, um, that just doesn't, um, 
there there isn't even like I guess for us we were struggling to find a single theory that works much less a variety right. of them that could account for all of the things that went wrong and happened and and I think some of that is just that there this Yuba incident hasn't gotten very much attention in the way that the Outlaw has gotten many people's attention over right. I mean it happened in 59 so over a, a longer period of time and it's been much more high profile yeah um so maybe over time and and with more attention coming to it maybe some some hypotheses will develop for for the Yuba incident too but. yeah definitely i think the 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 internet has done already a pretty good job in fact i refreshed the reddit link while we were doing this yeah that thing keeps growing yeah and hourly there were um there were new news articles that, that had been oh, really? out there that i hadn't even seen so um the internet the internet bees grow and stuff cool. with their their group uh their group sleuthing of things so if y'all have uh if y'all have a theory or a thread that or you, more information too or more information um hi at what if podcast.com is a good way to get in touch with us otherwise you can visit us at what if podcast.com and there's a contact form on that page twitter or facebook up. all that stuff yeah twitter is what if pod so is facebook um yeah, super, super curious to know what you guys think about this one because I'm pretty sure Spencer and I have been toiling for like 48 hours. And I, to... I'm, in terms of an answer or a solution, I am no further along than I was the first time I read it, honestly. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I still I still hold the um, I still hold the idea that a a schizophrenic leader of a group could spook a people could spook a group of uh of of men younger men who were developmentally disabled into acting out of logic and reason but there are so many other things that that doesn't account yeah, for that, either that, that just paired with i don't know several other things maybe would explain it but yeah. even that alone i mean I, I agree that gets closer than any other one thing would but it sure doesn't explain all of it. No, it definitely doesn't. It yeah. definitely doesn't. All right. All right we'll We've look. gone hella, hella long this week. But uh, we're sorry I, I think, slash you're welcome. Yeah, and, and, uh, <laughs> this, story, this story necessitated it. It did. So Again, hit hopefully us Hopefully you enjoyed it. Yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. We, we've been, uh, I mean, obviously it's a little grisly, but we've been definitely enjoying the mystery of it and trying to figure things out. Um, hit us up if you are a sleuth and you have any thoughts on the mystery. And uh, until next week. We promise we won't talk about anybody dying next week. We'll, yes, yes, we won't. We will go more lighthearted. We will, 100% will. What if you had the best birthday party ever? <laughs> the cake was dumb. <laughs> All right. There was a cloud. We'll be back with uh, Pizza Party next week. Oh, hell love yeah, you guys. Pizza Party. We love you. We'll see you next week. Bye. We'll be back next week with another episode of the What If Podcast. Learn more at www.whatifpodcast.com.